help you? Yeah, it's been a while since you uploaded. You alright? I'm good. I just... I... I can't think of an idea. I... I feel like I've done everything. Well, you gotta have something. Like an idea you've been oh. saving for a while. Oh. Oh no. I... I suppose that's about due. Call you back later, hey? Alright, what does she even say? I can't even read it. Let's turn on a fucking light. What the fuck am I supposed to do with that? Bruh! Hi, I'm Snoopy, and today we're doing something we were arranged in the last two times. And I don't just mean because of the outfit. We're not even using an IA32 this time. So as you probably know, the options these days for new operating systems or lower power PC Max is fairly limited and ever shrinking. But what if I said there's another way? What if I said it's an infinitely customizable and optimizable operating system that is as up-to-date as you want it to be? Well, you better grow a beard or get some pastel pink thigh highs because you're not gonna like the answer, it's Gen 2. Yeah, we're selling Gen 2 on PowerPC, God help us. This is a PowerMac G4 Gigabit Ethernet. Released at the dawn of the new millennium, my particular example has... Right, so fun thing happened during testing. This computer kind of brokey, it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. One of the capacitors decided to fuck off with force. Oh, uh, see? So, uh, yeah, obviously we're not gonna do much with this. Fortunately, I have another powerful PowerPC Power Mac. This is an iBook G4, released at some point in 2004. It has a 64GB SD card and 256MB of RAM, all powered by a 1.2GHz PowerPC G4 processor. We're using this because it works, which is uh, unfortunately more than I can say for this, which is a shame because this one was cooler and had two CPUs, but oh well, I guess I'm glad we didn't find out later. So I kind of glossed over it earlier, but what is Gen 2? Well, to use an example and oversimplifying here, this will piss people off. Essentially, if Arch Linux is Linux Minecraft, then Gen 2 Linux is making your own Minecraft. Now, I know what you're probably thinking. Wow, that sounds fucking stupid. Why would you do that? That sounds dumb. Well, essentially, since we're making Minecraft ourselves, we can control what blocks are in the game, how they're implemented, and how efficiently they're programmed, usually at the cost of time. But instead of Minecraft, it's an operating system. And instead of blocks, it's programs. And thus, we can build the operating system to our exact specifications. In our case, PowerPC. That's the beauty of Gen 2. You're the installer, and the installation is compiling the operating system package by package, e-build by e-build. I expect us to have a usable operating system in about five days to two weeks. What did I say again? Yeah, that might have been a little optimistic. Well, let's get started, shall we? You're going to Detroit. So those of you who are more familiar with the Gen 2 installation process might already see that we have a pretty small major problem. While yes, we've passed the requirements for running Gen 2 with flying colors, we don't pass the requirements for actually installing it, which is a problem. Now you might be thinking, oh, well that's fine, just put like four gigabytes of fucking swap on this hunk of shit and just fucking send it, right? Not exactly, because while yes, the SD card is fast, DRAM is significantly faster. So to make this the least painful process as possible, we're going to want to have the most amount of DRAM we possibly can. And because of that, we're going to be upgrading this computer to its full capacity. Using this one gigabyte stick, I definitely didn't get out of a PC. No PCs were harmed in the making of this video, I swear. So adding this stick will give us a full 1.2 gigabytes to install off of. Now you might be thinking, wow, 1200 megabytes, that's a weird number. Why isn't it like two gigabytes or one gigabyte or, you know, an even number? And the answer to that is because 
because Steve Apple thought it would be really funny if he, instead of giving two upgrade slots, one already pre-filled with 256 megabytes, to instead just solder it to the fuck off motherboard. So we can't exactly upgrade that without kidnapping DOS Dude 1, and I'm pretty sure they would not appreciate that. So let's just put the RAM in the computer and just settle for 1.2 and some swap space. All you need to do is take a flathead screwdriver, put it in here, and then turn it 360 degrees, and then just grab these clips, pull the keyboard off, pull it down, and then now we just need to remove the Wi-Fi card. You really shouldn't use a screwdriver for this, but I mean, it's, you know, you don't want to wreck your hands doing this, so just like pull that off, off of there, remove the antenna connector, grab this thing, pull out the airport card. Now we need to remove this little metal cage according to this diagram right here, but I've, I've done this so many times, I might as well fucking speed run it. And now we can take this little metal part, Putting that Wi-Fi antenna back in is a real pain, so just like flip it over like that, I guess. And now we can just take our RAM, line it up with the notch, push it in, and then push it down. And the RAM is now upgraded. From a company that would later on, if it were fucking legal, fill their computers with glue and plastic explosive, this is pretty fucking cool. Don't ask how you're supposed to replace the hard drive. That experience I still have nightmares about. Now luckily we don't need the Wi-Fi card to turn the computer on, so I'm just gonna take this, plug it in here, turn it on. And it works! Nice! Now we need an install CD. Also, I guess I should probably put this shit back t together and get the fuck, what the hell, um... Oh god. You like my 800 watt CD burner? I wish I was kidding, that's like all I use this thing for. Hmm. So before we start, I'd love to give a huge thank you to Nova the Gen 2 Goddess, Amber, DistroHopper39B, as well as David Phantom for answering my stupid questions, and just in general helping with the hopeful execution of this project. And also everyone who left various forum posts and blogs over the years of their experiences running Gen 2 on PowerPC Max. They truly walked so that I could limp. Many people died on this path, and so will we, because I have a dumb small brain. And that's all the confidence I can muster, so let's get started, shall we? So now to do the second half of the first step. That's right, we've actually already started the installation according to the handbook. The first part of step one is to find an install CD, and uh, yeah, so hopefully the rest of the installation will be that easy. So now to actually start the install CD, all we need to do is uh, plug it in, which I'd like to mention this part is not in the handbook. Uh, you gotta turn it on, you take the install CD, and then you just kinda... And it works! Nice! So now we need to be very quick, because if left alone it will try to auto-boot the PowerPC64 version for god knows whatever reason. I don't know why they put that as the first one. I can't imagine there are that many people installing Gen 2 on PowerPC 64 machines, or at least more than PowerPC 32 machines, but I don't know. This part kind of takes a while, I have no idea why. Now we're in the Gen 2 installation CD. So, uh, something you might have noticed is that, um, this screen is, like, really bad, and this keyboard is somehow worse. So first order of business is going to be remedying this. Luckily, this installation CD comes with SSHD, so all we need to do is run RC service, SSHD start. Grab some internet. Plug it in. Run IPA. Oh god, the spacebar. And now we have an IP address, so now all we need to do is connect to it. Okay. What an interestingly worded message. Oh yeah, we need to actually give it a password first. Forgot about that part.
and we're in. Just to show you that I'm not like actually cheating, if we do cat slash proc slash CPU info, as you can see, we are running a PowerPC 7447A with Altavec, and it is an iBook G4. So I'm not like actually selling it on, what are we actually running this on? Well, that's one way to do it. Okay. So if we now run, uh, what is it? Uh, free. The fuck is that bullshit? Okay, uh, free dash H. As we can see, our RAM upgrade works. So uh, now at this point, I bet I know what you're probably thinking. Ah, so this is where you start the new installer, right? You just gotta do like, I don't know, dot slash gen two dash install or some shit, right? <laughs> No. When I said you're the installer, I meant it. And when I said you're installing it from scratch, I didn't mean from the grocery store, bitch, I meant from the woods. Look at it this way. At least we're not using LFS. The thing don't even give you a woods. Luckily, we have and will be mostly sticking to the Gen 2 handbook, which I must say is one of the most well-written and well-articulate pieces of literature I have ever had the honor of laying my eyes on. In fact, I would go as far as saying that if you do not know how to install Gentoo even after reading the handbook, you should probably stop using computer and return to preschool. <laughs> Except for when it's wrong. Just like, actually wrong. But uh, yeah, let's actually get this going, shall we? Because I don't know if you know this or not, but this is gonna take like, kind of a, kind of a while. What the fuck is this? So the first thing I want to do before we move on to the next step of the handbook is to actually see what's up with the CPU governor. Because this is a PowerPC 7447A, this CPU has something called DFS. That essentially means when the CPU isn't being used, just like speed step but cursed, it will clock the CPU down to only 600 megahertz. So I want to make sure that Linux can actually properly take care of DFS because I don't want to compile Gen 2 at 600 megahertz. So the first thing I want to do is actually max the CPU and then see what the speed is to see if it's actually clocking up. But before we do even that, what we should probably do is load into screen. The reason for that being, since we're doing this over SSH, if the SSH session is interrupted or something, we don't want whatever process we're running to actually be quit, which will happen if we're not running inside of a virtual terminal, like screen. I know there's lighter ways to do this, but screen is just the way that I know how to do it. Screen-ls, as we can see, we are now loaded into a screen. What we're going to do to max the CPU is, uh, DD if. So essentially what this is doing is it's taking random shit and putting it nowhere. Okay, so now if I control A detach, which gets us out of the screen, I can now do top and we can see that we're using 100% of the CPU with DD. So now if I Okay, the CPU is now running at 1.2 gigahertz, so Linux can actually make proper use of the dynamic frequency scaling. I was worried about that, so that's good. We're going to be compiling Shinto at the CPU's maximum speed. And now we can control C this. As you can see, we're transferring at 64.9 megabytes per second, which was uh, very close to being nice. So now that we're in our screen and we do screen dash ls to make sure we're in it, we can now start the very first step in installing Shinto, which is configuring the network and making sure it's working properly, uh, which I, 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 I'm not totally sure, but I think we're pretty close. Yeah, so the net is working. Very nice, very nice. Cool. Step two done already. God damn, now it's fucking quick. So now that the net is working, the next step is to configure the block device, or hard disk. Now, if you're wondering why this video is coming out so late, this is a pretty big reason why. It isn't exactly straightforward or normal in how it works, actually. Because it's PowerPC, it uses open firmware and is a New World Mac. It only boots off of HFS formatted partitions on APM formatted drives, which means we can't use regular F disk. So uh, yeah, we, we, can't, we can't use that. Instead, we have to use a program called Mac F disk, a lovely program that has not been updated since like 2004. Dev SDA. And now the first thing we should do is print. And as we can see, there is no partition table. I wonder when that happened. Question mark to get a list of what everything does. And the first thing we need to do is initialize a partition map, which is done with I and then uh, press enter. And if we press P again, as you can see, we now have a partition map. And now this is where things get interesting because I didn't know for the longest time how exactly this is supposed to be set up. But after a lot of research, I've uh, figured the best way to do this is probably just uh, exactly how it says in the handbook, but with a little bit of padding as you'll see. So now that we have a partition map, we now need to press B. This will create an Apple boot block. First block, um, what? And now it should be two 
map to partition. So now if we print the partition map back again, we should see that we now have an 800 kilobyte Apple boot block. Uh, we'll get into what that is for later. This isn't slash boot, it's actually something very different. Apple computers don't need a slash boot because that's where the bootloader goes, I think. So the next thing we need to do is create the swap. So now we need to do C and then 3P, which is the third partition. Now this is what I mean when I say we're gonna do it with a bit of padding. The thing is, I don't know if the kernel needs to be stored in the boot block, or if it can just be stored on the root partition, so all of our work doesn't get undone and all of our compilation has to be erased. I'm going to make this kind of big. The kernel at most could be 100 megabytes if I were to guess, so what I'm gonna do is actually give us a five gigabyte swap partition. So we're just gonna call it swap. Now if we print it back again, we now have five gigabytes of swap. Now, this is fucking massive, but I have a good reason. And that's for if we do actually need to expand the boot block so that we can put a kernel in it if we need to, or if the bootloader is too big, we can just make swap smaller and make it bigger. We can't make the start of any partition different without erasing it. So I would rather that be the swap, which we can just swap off, resize, and then swap back on, instead of that be the root partition where we would then have to start over again. We can take a gigabyte away from this, and that would have been, four gigabytes would have been what I went with otherwise. So now we need to create the root partition. So we're going to do 4p. Oh wait, so c, 4p, enter length, and now since this is going to be the root partition, we want to use the rest of the disk. So what I'm going to do is just press enter. Hmm, or, uh, what? Uh, maybe if I enter 4p again. Oh, okay, there we go. So we're going to name it root. Now if we print it back, we now have our entire partitions ready for the installation. So now we need to write it with W. The drive is blank, we're not losing anything. And now it'll sync disks. And now if we do P again, we should see our partition map is still there. So now, I'm, I haven't tried this. What I want to see if FDisk can make anything. Oh no. <laughs> Oh boy, oh, oh no. So we can't use FDisk anymore because FDisk is apparently only for MBR and GPT disks and this is an APM disk, so instead of that we have to do that. So now we have SDA1, which we will not be touching. We have SDA2, which we will be touching but later. And we have SDA3, which we will be swapping on imminently. And SDA4, which is where the install will actually be going. So now we need to actually format these partitions. So the first thing we need to do is mkfs.ext4. This will be our root partition, sda, uh, so the root partition is sda4. So this will format that drive as ext4. So now that the ext4 partition is done, we now need to format the swap partition, which is mkswap dev sda3. So now that SDA3 is now swap, we can now swap on slash dev slash SDA3. So now if we do top again, as we can see, we have five gigabytes of swap and also 1.2 gigabytes of physical memory. So now we need to mount our new root partition, which to, um, I wonder if this works. What about if I do just dash ls? Hey, that's handy. Actually really handy. Okay, thank you. So now we need to mkdir slash mnt slash gen2. What do you mean it exists? You shouldn't exist. Or oh, I forgot the dash dash parents part. Oh. Okay. Huh. Weird. So now we need to actually mount it. So that would be mount slash dev slash sda4, which is the root partition onto slash mnt slash gen2. So that that's mounted. We can now move on to the fun part. So the next step is to download and extract the stage three tarball. Now essentially what this will do is give us a base gen two installation to actually build the system off of. So to do that, the first step is actually updating the current time. So this is so SSL works. So we're gonna use NTPD or network time protocol daemon. At least I think that's what it is, dash Q dash G which will now update the current time using the network. So, if we take a date, as you can see, it is currently January 19th, 2023. Don't ask. So now we need to download the tarball. So we're gonna cd into slash mnt slash gen2. 
So if we do DF, we can actually see MNT slash Gen 2 is actually the physical hard disk inside of the computer. DF isn't really meant for this. It is handy for mount points, but you're not really supposed to use it for this, but that's not going to fucking stop me. So now we're going to use a line mode web browser called links to download the tarball. So that's links gen2.org. As we can see, we are actually here and HTTPS is working. So the date is set correctly. So going to go to downloads, move uh, right on past all of the ones for normal computers that sane people install Gen2 on. And we're going to go over to PowerPC. So stage archives. So we're going to want a stage three open RC package for PowerPC. So I have been told that I would be skinned if I used the system D one. So we're going to go with open RC, despite the fact that I don't like it. Content types application exif. We're going to save it. We're going to save it there. That is what the fuck? Really? 10 megabytes per second, huh? This is saying have a gigabit ethernet controller. That's fast as fuck. Okay, that's a little surprising. That's cool, I guess. Okay, nice. So now we're gonna control C out of there, LS, and as we can see, we have our stage tarball, LS-L, as we can see, mm, it is 206 megabytes. Now, if I was a good girl, what I would be doing next would be verifying the integrity of this package, but I'm not. So instead, we're just going to extract it because I like living dangerously. Full disclaimer, if you're going to do this on a system you actually plan on using, I would suggest verifying it. But just as with anything in Gen 2, it's up to you. I'm going to choose danger because fuck you. All right. No, 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 no. I got this. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. What is it now? Oh, I put an E in it. Huh. Whoa, okay, so it is blasting the screen, look at that! So we're now extracting a base system for our Gen 2 installation. <laughs> Power PC, my beloved. I love how most of this is apparently Python and there's just like two, two versions of it installed. <laughs> yeah, so that actually kind of took a while, but there's a good reason for that. So let's just LS in here and see what's going on. So as you might notice, hmm, that looks suspiciously like an installed system. And if we run disk free again to see what's going on, we can actually see that 1.4 gigabytes of the root partition is already used. Because at this point, effectively, Gen 2 is already installed. We could just install a kernel, which we could just, like, take the one from the install CD, and then get a bootloader, which we could do after CH rooting, which we can do in a couple minutes. We could reboot, and then Gen 2 is effectively running on the iBook. But then our install would be entirely generic, and that's just not the point of Gen 2. The point of Gen 2 is to have an install that is entirely tailored to the hardware you run it on, with no compromises for what some other computer might support. Port. The point is to have an operating system basically completely tailored to what you're using. Which brings me on to the next step. The C flags and the CXX flags, this is what makes Gen 2 Gen 2. And the next step is to configure them so that they are specifically for this computer. Instead of actually nanoing it directly, like it says in the handbook, we are instead going to actually CD into ETC portage. Now if we LS in here, we will see there's the make.conf. So if we have a nano and we look at the make.conf, in its current state. As we can see, the common flags are set to O2, which is a little bit of optimization for a generic PowerPC32 machine. And also Pipe is there, which does some uh, optimization um, that essentially makes it compile faster by using more RAM, I think. I I'll try to explain this the best I can, but I don't really understand it. We're not going to be using this generic configuration file because that would be uh, no fun. Instead, we're going to actually tune this specifically for this computer, but we're not going to do it in here. So earlier when I said that I got a lot of help getting this ready, I wasn't kidding. You see, the most complex thing that I've ever installed thus far is actually Alpine Linux. So when it came to making my own make.conf, I had no idea what the fuck I was supposed to do. So I asked Nova the Gen 2 Goddess for help and basically just made me a make.conf, which I'm going to try my hardest to explain, but I'm probably going to fail miserably. This isn't a tutorial, please don't hurt me. It was actually kind of funny how much thought I gave this. I was thinking, do I have to HFS format a thumb drive? Do I have to use Mac OS or something? Do I have to use like SSH FTP or something? Then I kind of remembered, oh right, I have a website, so I can just do this. I'm not sure if I'm going to leave it on there. If you want to have a look at it, I don't know, but we'll figure it out, I guess. So as you can see, this is a little bit more 
beautiful. Here, instead of MCPU being set to PowerPC, it is actually set to MCPU equals 7450. And that's because we're compiling specifically for the PowerPC 7450 series, which the PowerPC 7447A used in this PowerBook 6,5 is a member of. We're also using O3, which is a higher optimization level, which has been known to be buggy and crashy, but she said she hasn't had any issues with it, so fuck it, I guess. We also have support for the Altavec Vector Processor, or Velocity Engine, in here. We have FNO Strict Aliasing, which does something, I would imagine. We have Fuse Linker Plugin, which does something else, I'd imagine. And then it kind of goes off the screen, but then that matches these things, which then these are other scary things. I don't know what they do, but she knows what she's doing, and uh, I don't, so I will just go with this. But something I will change is later we did talk about it that even though this is a single thread CPU, it can actually benefit from having two threads. Sometimes a compiler job will not use 100% of the CPU, so if we set it to two, it will actually compile with two threads, which might be faster in some cases, and since we have the swap for it, we might as well give it a try. Watch as it makes it slower. I think n threads might also want to be set to two, um, just in case. Um, but it seems it's only being used by FLTO, um, which reminds me, she initially had some crazy shit in here, which when I asked about those longer compile times, she said it might take like a month, and I was like, Please God, no. So, um, we commented that out. And as we can see, these are the use flags, which it isn't a thing actually in the uh, steps yet to add use flags, but might as well put them in there anyway, because another big thing about Gen 2, since we're compiling every program, we can choose what options are enabled in said program, which might make them smaller. So as you can see, we are not compiling in accessibility. We're not compiling in whatever the fuck that is. Why would we need NVIDIA support when we have a Radeon graphics card? Why would we need NVENC support when this computer came out like 13 years before NVENC was invented? And we need IEEE 1394 support since that's the uh, technical name for Firewire. So yeah, this is what makes Gen 2 Gen 2. In fact, once we recompile, this will compile binaries specific to this computer. For instance, if I were to somehow manage to revive my Power Mac G4 with a true love's kiss, this install wouldn't work on it because of the fact that since we're compiling it for the 7450, it wouldn't work on its dual power PC 7400s. So uh, let's move on to the next step, shall we? So now what we need to do is select the mirror. So we're gonna do mirror select, dash I dash O. Gonna set the output. And since we're in the directory, we can just set it to make.conf. So now it's going to give us a list of mirrors, I'd assume, and we can just select a couple. Okay, so let's see. We're not going to want the Australian ones. We're going to want one in the US at least. Germany, Hong Kong, Italy, Japan, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Philippines, Poland, Romania, Russia. Oh, the USA. Here we go. It's going to select the Gen 2 one. Might as well. Might as well select uh, Rochester. That's in New York, isn't it? Ohio State University. Okay, we're going to select those. I live in Indiana. This isn't exactly a secret. So OSU isn't that far. So there we go. Now that the mirrors are selected, just out of curiosity, I want to see what that looks like. Okay, so there's the mirror list, just basically put at the bottom, which I, I guess that works. So now we need to configure the Gen 2 eBuild repository. So slash MNT slash Gen 2. Okay. Copy slash MNT slash Gen 2 slash... So now what we should be able to do is if we have a look at this, uh, yep, that should, that should be great. That looks good to me. That's a, that's good. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So now we need to copy the DNS information. So, um, that's CP dash dash dereference. Okay. So now we're getting ready to ch root. So what we're going to do is do mount dash dash types proc oh oh no i get it oop <laughs> wow okay that was nearly a bad slash sys dash dash make dash slave it will dash r slave it will <laughs> yeah slash sys dev dev slash run slash run okay it's gonna quietly make sure i actually got that right because i'm pretty sure it's like really bad if i don't to dev, yeah, no, that looks right. All right, I'm gonna hope that's correct. Let's make sure there's no laughing. If there's text on screen, fuck you. So now we're going to chroot into the new environment. So chroot slash mnt 
slash gen two slash bin slash bash. There we go. Now we're going to source slash etc slash profile. Now we're going to export. Uh, fuck. So now I guess that just say it's there that that's the C. Is that all that does? <laughs> this is amazing. So we're now in the new Gen 2 environment. So when I said that extracting the stage 3 tarball was effectively installing Gen 2, we're now running on that installation. So everything so far appears to be working just fine. Now the next step in the handbook is to mount the boot partition. And this is the part where the handbook is kinda just wrong or incomplete or something because guess what? We don't have a boot partition. Because this is a Mac, there's there's no boot partition. There we have a yeah, 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 yeah. So now what we need to do is update emerge or portage. Is emerge a command of portage? I don't really know how that works. But the point is we're gonna run the command emerge dash web rsync. Nice. So cool thing about Linux on PowerPC Max or pretty much all Macs in general is that the sleep wake light is actually used as the hard disk indicator light. So that's why that's doing that. I know you can't see it anywhere else, but you know, just as proof we are running it on there, we are definitely running it on the iBook. So just as an example, uh, since this is kind of taking a while to show you how screen can help us, if I do control A, detach, we are now detached from that screen, but if I run top, we are still running rsync. So I could even go as far as, so control C, I can go as far as actually exiting. So, you know, if I do NeoFetch, we can see that this is Arch Linux running on the T420. I can now SSH back in and then screen dash R. And we're right back where we were. Ooh, statistics, my beloved, nice. 13 news items need reading for repository Gen 2. How fun. So the next step is to apparently read the news. So if we just do E select news uh, list, got some uh, got some news. So yeah, there's actually some pretty interesting stuff here. I see this isn't updated very often, so that's pretty interesting. Last update is from, well, okay, a couple of weeks ago, but still. So now we need to choose a profile. So if we do e-select profile list. Oh, how interesting. I'm pretty sure we're gonna want six. That's odd. Why are you showing me the PowerPC 64 once? Okay, uh, well, I'm pretty sure we're gonna want six because it is default Linux PowerPC stable. If we were to show desktop or systemd or GNOME or anything like that, that would, uh, th things would take uh, quite a bit longer. If we're gonna go any further than just having a basic Gen 2 installation, we'll do it manually, not using a profile. So we're just gonna do eSelect profile set and six, which is supposedly the correct profile. So now at this point, we can actually emerge packages. Uh, so before we go any further and give us a small taste of how long this is gonna take, let's emerge dash dash ask, ugh, I do not know how to spell, dash dash ask genlock, which this is essentially a logs parser for emerge. So it'll tell us handy things like, how long something took, how long something will take, etc., etc. It's like Webalizer, but for eMerge. Let's see, is it gonna need like 900 dependencies since we're on a basic installation? I can't need that many. I stand corrected. Well, holy shit. Yeah, that's a couple. Um, eh, fuck it, you only live once. It probably won't take that long. Everything here doesn't look that big. It'll be fine. So this means the make.conf works, so that's pretty cool. Uh. Yeah, so I just gotta give it a little while. It, it can't take that much longer, right? See, I knew it was gonna be that bad. It only took like an hour. So now if we run Shenlop, we should be able to see what the system is currently doing. Uh, so that should tell us what's compiling currently. Error, no working merge found. So there we go. Show fold merge history. Oh, yeah, there we go. Huh, so then that's all the times that those things happened. Hmm. Well, that's cool. 
Merge time, 53 seconds. So that doesn't also mean it's dependencies. So still though, that's pretty cool and will provide interesting information for the next step. Gentoo is the butt of many jokes. Usually surrounding its hard to installness and just the sheer amount of time it takes to install, you might have noticed so far, it hasn't really been that time consuming. And you're right, it hasn't been until now. The next command in the handbook is emerge dash dash ask dash dash verbose dash dash update dash dash deep dash dash new use at world. This command recompiles every package on the system. This has to be done because the stage package we downloaded is completely generic and this recompiles every package in that tarball to actually reflect the changes to our make.conf. After this command is done, all of the packages on the system will be for this exact computer. But the thing is about that, the system at the current point is made of about 200 packages, and some of them are pretty big. So this command will take anywhere between two to four days. But without it, this isn't really Gentoo. So I suppose we better get started. There's no turning back now. Ah, uh, let's see how long this takes. It will ask us again because we passed ask, so I don't know why. Um, oh, oh, that's not that much. What? Seriously? 50 packages, 30 new, one in new slot, 11 reinstalls. That's not that much. What? Uh, hmm. Do we miss something? I'm gonna go to bed. So, uh, cool fact, uh, not actually what that command does. All that command in the handbook does is update the, uh, packages, um, that have updates. We're not actually re-emerging every package on the system. Um, that is a different command, um, which we still have to do because we, we need the optimizations we put in the make.conf. So, I actually have to do this. So this, this hurts, yeah. Um... Okay, here we go. Starting over again, yay! Ask dash e dash dash keep dash going at world. It's not even giving me a number this time. <laughs> Can I shift page up? No, I can't. This is SSH. Well, it's not like we're not gonna do it, I guess, so... 343! Holy fucking shit, it's been like 12 hours. All right, well, let's see if we can check our progress here. Oh God, GCC. Yeah, I hear this one takes a little while. So as you can see, we're currently 148 out of 343, which I guess is to be expected, to be honest. Um, which means this is probably gonna take a quite a while longer and especially just on GCC, because we're essentially recompiling the fucking compiler. Oh, yeah, about that. So, um, turns out there's this funny subreddit called Unix Socks. So I just kinda, um, you know. What the fuck are you doing? Why is it taking so long? Holy fuck! Oh no. Gen 2, how could you tell? What's up gamers, Femboy Tech Tips here, and today we're looking at methamphetamines. Uh, I mean, Factory was a factory building genocide simulator where your greatest enemy is yourself from 10 hours ago, and there are hot milfs in your logistics network. Wait, this isn't Gen 2, this is crack, and I can't do the, the fucking Maxer voice, I swear. I have a fucking problem. Oh shit, it's done. Well, that took long enough. And with the help of Qlop, we can see that took exactly 2 days, 8 hours, 45 minutes, and 18 seconds. Most time-consuming package, of course, being GCC, which took a very timely 26 hours and 15 minutes. See, that's what happens when you recompile your compiler. So now that every package is fully recompiled with optimization set forth in the make.conf, we can now continue to the next step. The time zone. How exhilarating. So that was kind of a first. 
Uh, kind of lost footage there, actually. Um, so yeah, the time zone and the locale is set now, uh, which is fine. I mean, I guess it was boring anyways, but like, what the fuck? So if we do e select locale list, we are currently using UTF-8, so that's cool. Um, anyways, so now for the scary part, configuring the kernel, uh, which, um, full disclosure, um, I kinda, uh, did, did this already, so if we do eselect, cannot spell eselect right, it's a fucking... We currently have the Linux 6.0.19 kernel selected, and now you might be thinking, we're on 6.1 now, old man, why are you not upgrading? And the answer for that is because the Linux 6.1 kernel contains Rust support, which would mean compiling Rust on the iBook, and I'm nearly out of fire extinguisher. And besides, there's nothing wrong using a slightly out-of-date kernel, so 6.0.19 will do just fine. So since we emerged the kernel about in the past-ish, we now need to configure it. So we need to uh, cd um, slash user and um, uh, src slash uh, Linux. Hey, there we go. So if we do ls shell in here, as we can see, there's a kernel in there. And now if we do make menu config, I wonder if end curses will work properly on this uh, fucking SSH session. Oh, okay, that's good enough, I guess. I see we're missing some, but that's not that big of a deal. So this is how you configure the kernel. Uh, I mean, it's one of the ways to configure the kernel. Look, I mean, I'm a masochist, right? But, like, even I have my fucking limits, and configuring the kernel with a goddamn text editor is one of them. So this is basically where you turn some parts of the kernel on and turn other parts of the kernel off and configure some parts of the kernel like that one. I don't know what that does, but it's probably important. So in here you can do things such as enabling and disabling file systems. As you can see, we have support for ext4 and we don't have support for ext4 debugging because why would we need that? I'm not a developer. I'm a very bad YouTuber. We've also got some other things in here like uh, fzfs. Why would you need that? I definitely don't, but if you do, you can turn it on. In here we also have processor support. So as you can see, why would we have that enabled? Um, hmm. We have altvex support enabled because because we have one, and we have SMP, or Symmetric Multiprocessing, disabled because we only have one CPU, which if you were to have a multiprocessor machine like my poor, injured, broken Power Mac G4, you would probably want that. So another thing of note that we did in here is if we come over to device drivers, we have support specifically enabled for the ATI Radeon series and nothing else. Since we only have a Radeon graphics card, why would we also need support for AMD GPUs? So yeah, that wouldn't work. Um, also, no support for the NVIDIA cards because, well, the same reason. And here's another fun thing. If we come over to, um... You don't want to know how long that took. But as we can see, we're currently in device drivers, network device support, and in Ethernet driver support. And the fun thing, all of these options for all of the different network cards you might have are all enabled by default. But in reality, we only need one of them because this is a laptop and it's not exactly easy to replace the network card. It took me like 45 minutes to find this option, I swear to God. So that's basically how you configure the kernel. Now, if you are watching this video looking for instructions on how to make a custom kernel, I highly recommend against doing this because you see, um, when I said like an hour and a half, that isn't an exaggeration or an estimation that's like actually how long it took me. So if it's the first time you're trying to install Gen 2 on PowerPC, I would highly suggest just using Gen Kernel to make sure it works first and make sure the rest of your configuration is working properly. Because configuring the kernel is like a game of Clue, except if you get it wrong, your computer doesn't work. So uh, we're gonna hope this works. I haven't tried it yet, I just configured it. Um, so yeah, um, now we just gotta compile the kernel. So, I have an interesting idea for this. So, if I do uh, date, and if I were to pipe the output into a file, so let's uh, output it into, uh, I don't know, cat girls, I guess. Um, no, let's put it, let's put it in, let's put it in the home folder. Now, all of these will be executed in order. The reason I'm doing this being, since we're not using emerge, we can't use genlop or qlop to see how long it took. So if these are all executed in order, and if this works, I should have a fairly effective way of seeing how long it takes. So now if I press enter, this will now compile the kernel. So let's, uh, let's see how this goes, shall we? 
Oh lord. Yeah. So this won't take as long as GCC did, but it'll still take a little while. Since we stripped out a lot, it, it shouldn't take that long, but I guess we'll see. And about three hours later, it's done. As you can see, we have the compressed kernel and also the regular kernel. So now we just gotta install it. So now we need to copy the kernel to the boot uh, directory. So we just gotta CP uh, VM Linux. I, I think that's the version of the kernel. It could like, I don't know, fucking not be, but it, it's fine. Don't worry about it. There we go. So that has supposedly copied that in there. So if I just ls. I just realized what that command was doing. That isn't a directory that's... Uh... The name of the file? Okay. I'm gonna hope that's okay, but... Uh... It would make sense for me that it would still be called VM Linux, but... I... Guess that's okay. Uh, you know, we can actually double check, so... So 6.0.19 dash... Yeah, that's right. Okay, so that is the right version. Okay, that's that's good. So now we're finally in the final home stretch of configuring this base installation of Gen 2. So the next step is to edit the F stab. This is probably the most personally terrifying part for me because I have actually messed up F stabs before and then just like instead of actually fixing it just instead reinstalled the entire operating system but you know that was like six years ago. So uh, yeah hopefully this time will be better. It doesn't look that hard. ETC. No need to. What is in here? Well, that doesn't help at all. So what if we nano f-stab? Hmm. How interesting. So now in here we need to put in entries for all of our partitions and where they're mounted. Um, so this is fun. Might be a good idea to figure out what the devices are. It looks like I'm gonna need another TTY. LSBLK. Okay. So this tells us that- okay, alright. Now that makes sense. So these two things don't go in the f-stab. We're actually just gonna need sda3 and 4. So we're going to do uh, slash dev slash sda3, which is swap, tab, yeah, none, tab, swap, sw, no, ugh, sw, tab, zero, space, one. So now we need to put in the root partition, which is slash dev slash sda4. Four, tab slash ext4 so no a time this is for access time essentially we don't have any because it's a fucking sd card so according to the handbook this should be zero zero. Oh, okay yeah i, don't, I get it okay so zero zero <laughs> that could have been bad and that should be all we need since we're using apm and not gpt we don't have to deal with uuids so yeah it looks fine to me uh yeah while I enter. So now I need to set the system host name and I feel like we all know what this is gonna be. Echo. Ew woo. Now let's go a little before and make a gen two woo. Echo gen two woo into da 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 slash etc. Oh wait, we're already in etc. Let's just put in the host name. Host name. We uh, cat host name. As you can see, it has Gentoo. Uh, now we need to get network working on the uh, other installation. I don't even know if, will this work? Apparently. So first we're going to emerge DHCP CD. Oh, hey, no dependencies. That's what I like to fucking see. Ah, configure, my beloved. Well, that sure is cool. I don't know how to fix any of that. Okay, now that that's done, look at this curse shit. You want to know how you add a service to be started automatically on System Boot with fucking OpenRC? So it's RC dash update. Add DHCP CD. That default. So, okay. Now service DHCP CD is now added to run level default. That means it'll start when the computer does. So now we need to actually start it, which means an entire different command, RC dash service, and entirely different syntax too. See, the package comes next this time, and then you press space, and then you do start, and then that that starts DHCP CD. Um, yeah, I figured that because it's running on the install CD. Ah, doesn't matter. But I love how it's so fucking user friendly. You see RC update add DHCP CD default, and then for actually starting the service, it's RC service, the name of the package, then start. Why didn't they just 
make them make sense. Like, you know, that's how it is in System D. You have System CTL enable, and you have System CTL disable, System CTL start, System CTL stop, and they do the same thing, but it like actually makes sense. Now we need to configure the host file. Um, so that's uh, nano hosts. Yeah, um, I don't know what the fuck this means. So what we're gonna actually do here is we're gonna add uh, Gentoo. As far as I can tell, this is really the only change we need to make. Um, is adding Gentoo here. Uh, control X, Y, enter. You need to set the root password. This is again for the actual installation. So we're gonna set a new password of uh, super secret password. Seriously? That's a first. Do you seriously not trust me to make a short password? Uh, wow, that's... I'm making it 420. It won't let me. Because the password's too short. Okay, how about 420, 420? Okay, bar. Seriously? What command did I run? There's no fucking way. And there's no way to bypass it? I, I honestly... That's crazy. Really? I've never seen this before. <laughs> I had no... Password requirements. Gen 2 won't trust you to make a short password. Okay, how about now? Seriously? What the fuck? I swear to God. Holy shit! You know, fucking hell. That shouldn't be that hard. Look, making it so you have to edit a fucking config file and just not letting people use a random ass long fucking password? You should be able to pick, is my question, and not have it be you have to look at the Gen 2 forms and try out three different solutions in order to get it to fucking work. Who knew? Setting the goddamn password would be so hard. Anyways, now we need to nano rc.conf yeah i don't know what any of this means really to be honest now we need to set the key map so this is nano conf.d slash key maps so we've got the key map set to us we've got window keys set to interesting i think we should actually set this to yes because while it is a mac i i think the command key does actually work as a windows key so we're just gonna do that i, I think the key code is the same so, you know, might as well just turn that on. Now we need to configure the hardware clock. So this is nano config DHW clock. Well, since macOS is also Unix, that would mean that the internal clock is also UTC. Uh, because it wouldn't make any sense for them to make it any different. So it's probably fine staying UTC. If you dual boot with Windows, then you should set it to local, which we don't. So, uh, if anything, this computer has booted more funny operating systems than fucking macOS at this point. So now I need to install a system logger, so this is emerge. I'm just going to use the one on the handbook, I'm not sure what options there are. So we're just going to emerge dash dash ask. Syslogd. Oh, it's sysklogd. Huh. I wonder if this will work. I misspelled it. It's actually sysklogd, I wonder. Yeah, okay, it's sysklogd. Oopsies. We're going to do that. And the next step after that is to install a cron daemon. So uh, this is essentially, what is it, like fucking Windows services, but for Linux? That's a horrible explanation. <laughs> essentially, it automatically executes commands and scripts at certain points in the day, which you can set up using a cron tab. We don't really need one, but I'm gonna wonder why we don't have one later if I don't install one, so... Uh, which, even before that, it would probably help if I enabled the fucking system logger. Add k log d default so now i need to get crony since that's also like the, the default so you know yep. dependency is my beloved oh my fucking god okay that took a good 20 minutes now we need to enable cron so we're just going to take uh, crony so now crony is added to run level default now we need to install a locator, so this is, uh, if you want to find a file or something else, you would just run locate, and then uh, the name of what you want to find, that's this package, basically. Gonna say yes. Oh, God. Okay, so now that that's installed... Huh, weird. 
Oh, interesting. So now, just in case the kernel configuration has a non-functioning frame buffer and uh, shit goes to fuck, we're going to want to add SSHD as well so that we can um, do disaster analysis and hopefully fix it. So that will add SSHD to run level default. So whenever it starts up, so will SSHD. Now we need to enable crony spelled slightly differently. This is to keep the system time in check by automatically updating it every once in a while. Well, yes. Well, that took long enough. Now we just need to add that as well. So, uh, so that's crony. Oh, crony D. Sorry. Oops. Crony Damon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nice. Now we need to also emerge the file system tools. So that's, uh, to FS progs. Gonna say yes. Now we're installing that. Sure is a lot of installing in this step, holy fuck. Now that the file system tools are installed, it is now time for the next step, which is a total Grimalkin. Pulse Nur Cordiva. Now this is where shit gets real. At this point, our Gen 2 base installation is basically completely done, but we need a way to start it that isn't just launching the installation CD and CH rooting in, because that isn't exactly convenient. Um, also, we're still running on the old kernel, so we need to start the new one. Small problem though, the bootloader in the handbook, Yaboot, is uh, very broken and doesn't work. So we're going to be deviating from the handbook and instead installing Grub, according to this form post, which was not trivial to find. Written by... Y'all and your unreadable usernames. Okay, well it's on screen, but thank you for writing this because without it we would be pretty lost. So let's get started, shall we? Oh yeah, so uh, while you were gone, I might have uh, imaged the hard disk just in case shit hits the fan, we're not starting over from scratch. Also, ignore the RAM obelisk. Um, I stayed up one night kinda late and then I woke up and that was just sorta there. Um, look, let's just get the fucking bootloader installed. I'm <laughs> think about the Eldritch Horrors later. Gonna go right back where we were. Uh, gonna do the fucking... Huh. Who knew? So actually, single quotes makes it ignore variables. Huh, didn't know that. So what we need to do is tell Grub what kind of platform we're actually running here, so it actually compiles correctly. So we need to echo IEEE 1275. Let's see make.conf. Now if we cat make.conf, we should be able to see our changes. Very nice. So there we go. There is the uh, lovely other thing which we need. Now what we need to do is install Grub. Who knew? So we're going to emerge dash dash ask grub. So simple and straightforward. So far, you know, there's gonna be something that makes this like not just not fucking work. It's funny that the guide actually says to actually um, unmask it first. According to the Gen 2 packages website, it shouldn't actually be masked right now. Maybe it's out of testing. Maybe there's actually some progress being made. And would you look at that? It's not masked. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, so now we're going to just answer yes to it and its dependencies. Skinter Y, and now it's gonna start installing all this bullshit. Christ on a stick, it's been like half an hour. Fucking finally, goddammit. Uh, hmm, I think we might actually need OS Prover. Oh wait, for detecting other operating systems, okay, so we don't need it, okay, that's good. Next we need HFS utils. Hey look, no dependency is my favorite. Debian. What the fuck? That didn't actually take that long. So now this is where shit gets fun. So to remember what we're actually fucking doing here, I'm gonna do mac f disk dash l slash dev slash sda. Bitch, what the fuck? Um, oh, okay, so yeah, it's just one package. Okay, might as well do this just in case shit hits the fan. Okay, and now that that's done, if we do f disk mac f disk dash l again, much better. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is format the new world boot block. Um, which, according to the guide, the next step is actually zero filling it with DD, but I don't think that's necessary, and besides, I'm one character away from spending another goddamn month making this fucking video, so I'd rather avoid that, and instead, let's just make sure we pick our number very wisely, and we go with SDA2. So, H format, just my bootstrap, slash dev, slash SDA2. Oh, wait, what? That's the thing about these fucking fonts. I don't know what this is. Is that an I or is it an L? It's an L. <laughs> you know, it's monotype font sometimes. 
there we go. The bootstrap partition is created. I wonder what it'll say this time. So, Mac F desk dash shell. Same thing both times, so I guess it's good. Now that the partition is formatted, we now need to mount it, um, which means making it a mount point, which if we ls slash mnt, okay, so we're gonna mkdir slash mnt slash bootstrap. Now we're going to, ah, fuck. Mount dash t hfs slash dev slash sda two. Okay, I'm not sure why the CD-ROM just spun up. Um, we should still be using the other install, but whatever. It might be because I twiddled the disks or something, I guess. So now, what happens if we do ls slash mnt slash bootstrap? Is there anything on here already? Or, yeah, so, okay, it's, it's just empty. How interesting. I swear to God, if this command, this command seems like magic to me, but if it doesn't work, we're kind of, we're pretty fucked. So grub dash install dash dash mac ppc dash directory slash mnt slash bootstrap mac ppc dash directory ah see i almost got it wrong equal sign it's telling for the power pc ieee 1275 platform installation finished no errors reported we're going we're golden so far you tell I'm rather shaky about this process. Um, so if we do this again, as we can see, we now have a mock kernel as well as a system folder, which that's one of the great things about this computer because it was made by Apple. This thing was literally designed just to boot Mac OS and nothing else. So booting anything else on this hunk of shit is literally just a hacky workaround. We have a disembodied part of a fucking OS X install to get it to boot Linux. Now we need to unmount the bootstrap partition. or actually not so fast, because the next step is to fucking mount it again. Um, okay, so if we mount it again, we need to h a trib. So this says hfs attributes, I would guess, so that it needs to be blessed. If it's not blessed, then open firmware will not boot it, I would assume. Dash t tbxi, which is very familiar to those of you who mess with this stuff often. C unix. Why is it using colons? Whatever. Um, wait, what? Okay, so first we need to actually cd into that directory. So uh, we're gonna cd into slash mnt. I know exactly what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I will be very surprised if the shit boots afterwards. And okay, so boot dot boot x needs to be blessed. So we're going to do so forcefully. Um, oh, so that was not kept in my buffer. I hope this video shows all of you who ever thought I was smart that actually know I am a big dumb stupid head. H a trib boot x. So this should just be that file. Motherfucker, it's right there. Okay, sure, fine. Um, let's do that. Dash t dash c unix boot x. It's right there. It's right fucking there. Maybe it's got something with the colons thing. So system... Sure, okay, fine, whatever, yeah, okay. And it's not any different because we're messing with HFS and not uh, normal Unixness. so it's pretty much all just black fucking magic in here. Oh, okay, so what we're doing is assigning TBXI to bootx, which is the kernel, or kernel, that it's booting. I'm gonna tr I'm trying to understand what this means. Oh, it's dash B, so this is blessing the folder. Okay, colon folder is blessed. So now we need to hu mount. How the hell does this work? Is it not mounted? I genuinely have no idea what the fuck that just did, but I mean, if it works, it works, and I guess I'm not complaining. So, <laughs> oh, okay, that was by accident, but that works like, why is it two of them? I, mean, I need to lay off the, the fucking sharpie markers, god damn it. So now the next step in the guide says to vi grub.conf, but I'm not falling for that shit. Nano slash etc slash default grub. Nice! Grub and then all this other shit in here is just uh, commented out. 
which I don't think we need any of this. Is just an example configuration or... Yeah, okay. Well, I guess none of this applies to us. Well, yep, that looks all fine to me, I guess. All right, well, that's cool. Um, nice, no configuration needed, my favorite. So now we need to do grub. Every last little bit of this feels fucking wrong to me, but grub-mk config. Ugh. Dash dash output equals slash boot slash grub slash grub dash cfg. Generating grub configuration file. Found Linux image. Okay, that's very good. Warning, OS Probe will not be executed to discover the other bootable partitions. There fucking are none. Done. So, okay, what happens if we cat this? <laughs> okay, well, here I was trying to be clever. Fine. We'll look at it in a fucking text editor if you insist. Linux slash boot kernel root equals dev sda4 read only? Ah, uh -huh, that's fine, I guess. Um, oh my god. This looks like it might actually fucking work. I know it looks like I'm surprised, but, I mean, the amount of bullshit that makes this work, or even close to working, is astounding. I don't know, this is what everybody else uses, you know, the other two people have done this in the past couple of decades, because Yabu doesn't work, so I guess I don't have any reason to think it won't, so, yeah, we're done. It's funny, I was, like, looking back at the footage and I realized that I fucking forgot to unmount it again and fucking... Why did I do that? <laughs> God damn it. So, you mount, we need to unmount the bootstrap partition, which we should have done a while ago, but who is keeping track? Anyways, so at this point, the Gen 2 installation is fully installed, and also the bootloader, in this case Grub, is fully ready to be used, probably. At this point, all we have to do is reboot the computer, but... We aren't out of the woods just yet. You see, the amount of things that could still be wrong is astronomical. The biggest problem that we could have, this is my and Nova's first time setting up a kernel for PowerPC Max. There could just be something turned off that we need, or there could be something turned on that will actually interfere with everything else. We have no idea, but there is only one way to find out. And if it is true, if there is something wrong with the kernel or something else, then we can just start the installation CD and see a troop back in, but troubleshooting is a whole lot more painful than just following a guide because there is no guide. We could even have a problem where there's just like, you know, no fucking screen output because we didn't set up the frame buffer properly or something's interfering with the frame buffer. So it is time to complete the final steps in the handbook. First, we need to exit from the CH root. So this is just exit. Now we need to umount slash dev. Oh, now what ever could be using that? Can I fucking make it? Uh, okay, um, what's in there that could possibly be busy? Mm, yeah, that makes sense, but god damn it. So what about if I do uh, this? Okay, um, now what about if I just do that? Huh, interesting. Well, that worked. So now we need to umount dash r, which I, if I were to imagine is recursive. Gen 2. Of course it's busy. Helpful encouragement right here. Okay. Encouragement appears to have worked. Oh, it's dash R capital R. That might be part of the reason why. If we LS in here, it should be empty. Yeah, very good, very good. So, uh, now let's exit. And now let's move over to the iBook. Well, I guess there's no turning back now, is there? After having this computer on for so long, it feels so wrong to do this, but... It's time to see if it works. Let's fucking do this. The computer is rebooting. We've got the chime. I'm gonna hold the eject button so it ejects the CD-ROM. Ejected that. We've loaded something. Welcome to Grub, holy shit! And here are our boot options. Okay. Now it's time to see if the kernel loads. Loading. Linux 6. Okay, we've got a flash. It is now loading open firmware. Very interesting. Loaded the CD-ROM drive. It appears we have... Nothing. Hmm. How interesting. <laughs> 
Oh God, here we go. <laughs> oh no. Um, oh fuck. This is where it gets fine. Let's try it again. Let's try advanced options and just see what that does, I guess. Recovery mode. Now I wonder what that does. It's gonna load Linux 6. Loading stuff in open firmware. Okay. Rebooting in 100 seconds. Unable to mount file system on an unknown block. Swapper not tainted. Huh. Okay. Well, progress? Reboot. So, okay, so I added some fun things. We're going to see if they work. So what I did is I made another minimal configuration that is basically just a copy-paste with the stuff filled in from, uh, from the forum post that said how to do this. So we'll see if this works. Maybe? Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay, then. Okay, so now we're going to try the init RAMFS. See if it even loads in the first place. Loading the kernel. Loaded the initial RAM disk. That appears to have worked. Now we're beginning to load in. Wait a minute. Okay, so that was like frozen for a solid 20 minutes. That's not... That's not doing anything. Okay, next day again. Compile the different kernel. This one has... Uh, pretty much everything enabled by the default PowerMac32 configuration specified in the handbook, and also I built an NRMFS with track cut, so this is basically an entirely to-the-book configuration. So, if this doesn't work, we aren't SOL just yet, we still do have another option, but if this doesn't work, I'm going to be actually pretty surprised, because, uh, like, what the fuck? What I will say, though, is that there's no reason why this shouldn't work. As you might notice, we installed the system just fine. If the install CD can do it, our installation should be able to do it too, we just need to figure out what option is keeping it from booting. I have everything enabled for the disk controller, everything is set up properly in Grub. I am astounded, I have no idea what the problem could be, but it's not working, so something's wrong. If I have to see it root into this again, I'm gonna be pissed. Okay, let's see, checked the Gen 2 installation CD. As we can see here, I reset the Grub configuration when I switch the kernel just in case, because we are using an inner RAMFS this time. Or not, just gonna not load the inner RAMFS, sure, okay. Is that gonna work even? Holy shit! Holy shit! Well, damn. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't expect that. Like, honestly, I did not expect... Well, there we go. Sure, the kernel isn't as optimized as I would like, it works, so I guess I can't really complain. So here we are. Gen 2 is running on the iBook all by itself. It didn't even use the RAMFS. So, oh, all right, well, let's make sure everything else works. So I'll get his root. The root password, oh my. Oh my, my, my. Make sure the network is working. It is. We don't have IPv6 support, but we don't use that anyway. I see the Wi-Fi card is also not working. Uh, that might be because I need to explicitly enable support for it in the kernel, which... I left everything default. I was trying to get something working, I guess. So, yeah. Security, why don't you secure some bitches? I love how we went through all this effort to install Gen 2 on a computer I won't bear to physically touch. I mean, look, the keyboard is as bad as it sounds. So while, yes, the kernel isn't as optimized as I'd like, let's try out some things on here. Besides, it's not like the kernel is actively making this any less performant. The only thing a more slim kernel would result in is less memory usage and a slightly faster boot time. So that's definitely something we can do later. So first thing, uh, do we have get? Do we have get on this? Do we have get? No. So we're gonna get get. It's so quiet. <laughs> Uh, get repository hosting user. Probably... Act group... Use... Account... Yeah, probably... Probably that one. Huh, nice. So now if I type get... Hmm, okay. Well, what the fuck? Okay, fine, we'll use user then. Hmm, interesting. Okay, so it's apparently dev VCS. Uh, hmm, okay. It's weird that didn't show up in the list. Yeah, that, that looks better. Yeah, no, I could believe that. Okay. Okay, so this is probably going to take a little while. But let's open up on the terminal here just to show you I'm not, like, pulling your leg or anything. If we do uname dash A, as we can see, we are running Linux on the hostname gen 2 on Linux 6.0.19 Gen2. That's the current day. That's the CPU. Altavec PowerBook 6.5. Or what does uname just run it? 
Linux. I guess I don't know what else I was expecting. Welcome to Power PC, where even the smallest packages take half a goddamn hour. Okay, that. What the fuck? So no, 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 no. We can't let that. Just we can't. We can't let that slide. How long did that take? Thirty-two minutes. Oh god. All right. Well, that's cool. Now we can fucking get, thank Christ. We're gonna MK dir. Ooh. Ooh. CD into ooh woo. LS. Me to get clone. Bucket. The uwu fetch folder. Uwu. So yeah, we're installing uwu fetch in case you haven't noticed. Um, I mean, come on, of course we do. Now we're gonna make build. Also make install. Nice. So let's see if this works. Uwu fetch. Nice. There we go. <laughs> 27 megabytes RAM usage, though. Holy shit. That's... That's really good, actually. Like, wow. I do not know why CPU isn't showing up, though. Yeah, that's a shame, honestly. I mean, you can't see what CPU it has if it doesn't list the CPU. I mean, to be fair, I'm probably, like, the first person ever running a Fetch on a goddamn G4. So let's also install NeoFetch. Now, this one will be fun, as you'll see. NeoFetch... As you can see, NeoFetch has been masked, and that's by the keyword PPC, so what we actually need to do first is unmask it. Now, the reason why it's doing this is because, as we can see, basically, both these versions are unknown because they say missing keyword, and then this one right here is masked by PowerPC because it's still in testing and not uh, actually fully stable. So, this is basically saying that NeoFetch hasn't been tested on PowerPC, and for our own safety, it's not letting us emerge it. But luckily, there's an override. Now the thing is, we could do this in the make.conf, that's what that funny line was for in the bit where we were setting it up, but I prefer to know why things don't work, so instead we're just going to do this package by package, since we're only installing one. So this is echo, quote, equals. So this is its location, this is the name of the package, and we're going to take that and pipe it into. Now we need the name of some arbitrary file, now this can be the name of the package, or it can, it, again, it's arbitrary, so we can make it capoise. So this will take that string and then pipe it into that file. So now if we cat this, as we can see, there's the name of the package. So now that there is a file with the name of the package that we want unmasked, if we run emerge dash dash ask again. Yeah, no, we also need the name of the keyword. Uh, okay, um, at least I think so. So, okay, we also need the package not accept underscore keywords into catboys as well. As we can see, we have the name of the package, the location, and also its version, and what keyword we're unmasking. So if I echo that in, and I try and run it again, since it's now unmasked, and also the keyword is accepted, now it should work. What did I fuck up this time? What did I fu- uh, Oh. Apparently nothing. I didn't fuck up a damn thing. All right, so now as we can see, uh, that thing I just did now works. So essentially you've told Portage to fuck off and let us install the package anyway. So now if we press Y, it's now going to begin installing NeoFetch. Or more accurately, we told Portage to fuck off because the developer of the application told Portage to not let us install it. Um, so actually we're kind of just telling the developers to fuck off. Uh, okay, so now if we run NeoFetch... There we go. As we can see, Gen 2 Linux Power PC on a PowerBook 6.5 Linux 6.0.19, been up for an hour, and it has a Radeon 9200 AGP with working frame buffer on a Power PC 7447A at 1.2 gigahertz. We fucking did it. This is Gen 2 running on the iBook, and it only took us 10 days. <sighs> Yeah, isn't that a sight to behold? It's, I'm not like trying to be excessive for the video here or anything. When I say that, using this installation feels a lot different from, you know, feeling an installation of Mac OS or Windows, given that, you know, we didn't just pop an installation CD and click a button and the system was installed for us. We brought this system into being from literally nothing. I mean, while well, yes, the Sage 3 tarball helped, we still installed it and we still configured everything, basically, mostly, sort of, almost. But on that note, I just want to say that if you're watching this video because you want to install Linux on your PowerPC, Mac, or whatever, don't do this. Please, God, don't do this. 
I know it looks simple from just the video and you might want to do it yourself, but, and I guess I'm not saying to not to, I'm just saying, please understand what you're doing here. This computer was on constantly for 10 days. This computer was at 100% CPU load for two days. That's not good for these systems. And if you do it, it might just never turn on again like my Power Mac G4 did. So I at least want you to know that on systems this old, running them at 100% capacity, letting them get hot, like I didn't pull my hand out from under it because I thought it was funny. I did that because it burned me. Just know that, you know, only do this on something you're okay with losing, I guess, or use DistCC, I swear to God, the amount of times I was asked to use DistCC during this project. But yeah, just keep that in mind. Also on that note, shortly after this video comes out, maybe a week or so, I don't know. Um, I plan on releasing a video where I actually compile some more things on the second channel with a time lapse so that you can see how it works and also a boot up video as well. So if you're curious and you want to see how long things actually take in real time with some actually really real figures, then there's a link in the description if you're watching this in the very distant future. So uh, yeah, and there we have it. Gen 2 is now installed on the iBook, fully self-stable even. Now I know what you're probably thinking. I can smell your thoughts. Now, Snoop, you're not going to leave it like that, are you? And uh, the answer is yes, unfortunately, for now. In a follow-up video, I plan on selling X and some other things while we're at it, but this video is way long enough as is. I swear no one's even watching this anymore. But if you are, leave a comment down below about your favorite Sharpie marker flavor. Mine is lavender. Any whoosies, I do believe that finally brings this project to a close. Huge thank you to Nat, Grot, E for me, B Dropper, Nilly, I dropped the fucking Sharpie, Danielle, and Shay for supporting the channel, and for putting up with my upload schedule that canonically doesn't exist. See you next decade where we become a VTuber or some shit, I don't know. Bye! Holy shit, I feel like that was actually a good take. Guess that's not, huh? Seasons don't fear the reaper, nor do the wind, the sun of the Ah, uh, hello? Hello. Well, I finished it. Oh, oh, you found an idea. Yep. Should be ready for release next couple of days. Not bad for a finale. Uh, oh, well, what do you mean? Change, my dear. And not a moment too soon. What?